So thank you for joining another episode of the Financial Literacy Network podcast. I'm Bob Stammers, and I help lead the FLN, which was organized to provide advice, resources, and support to CFA societies around the world interested in financial literacy and investor education and supporting other like-minded organizations looking for additional resources to help them manage their own programs. So today we have as our guest, Robin Master CFA, a board member of the FLN. Uh, her bio can be found on the title screen. Robin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to share what we're doing here in Bermuda. Right, so that's what I'd like to discuss with you. I wanna to talk to you about that. And I also wanna to talk to you about the benefits and challenges that a relatively small CFA society may face when creating and managing a financial education program. So to start off, why don't you give our audience um, the 30,000 foot summary of your financial literacy efforts at CFA Society Bermuda? Certainly, Bob. So before I even get to our financial literacy, let me just tell you a little bit about Bermuda. For those of you who don't know, it's an island and we're located approximately 700 miles off the coast of the Carolinas. We're not in the Caribbean. We're not part of the US, although it's our, the closest landmass. We're a British dependent territory, but we are a self-governing country. Our population is roughly 60,000 people. So um, if you want to put that into perspective, I'm told that means that our entire population can fit inside any one of the major football stadiums in the US or the UK, and you could still get 30,000 more people in it. So we're small and we're out here in the middle of the Atlantic, but we've got a diverse population, diverse nationalities, ethnicities, and people fall all across the economic spectrum. So in that way, we're no different than anywhere else. We have all of the same challenges when it comes to financial literacy that I think exist everywhere. So there, there's a broad need in the community for financial education. There's no formal curriculum in the schools. There doesn't exist a national um, strategy and people have the issues of uncertainty and fear when it comes to their money. So, so we as a CFA society said, we wanna do something about this. So what is that and how can we do it? Um, if you, if you know anything about Bermuda, you know, in general, we tend to punch above our weight. So as a society, we have no doubt that we could achieve something, but we recognized we're small. So how could we be most effective? So for us, we decided to focus on financial literacy in the strictest sense. So at this point, we don't offer anything related to investments and we don't do investor education. Maybe we'll do that one day, but not now. What would you say? What would you say the level of financial literacy? I mean, financial literacy is low in the U.S. It's low everywhere. But what would you say comparatively it is in Bermuda? Do you think it's less or just about the same? I'm going to guess it's probably about the same. And I'm saying that because I look at who comes to our programs and the range, the diversity of age, education, economics, it's, it's so across the board that I think that would be reflective of, it's, it's probably the same as the US. Yeah. It's interesting, you have such a small uh, area. I mean, you, even as a small society, you could probably cover quite a bit of the population either live or digitally, right? Yep, yep, so. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Do you want to talk about? Well, um, no, just, yeah, just talk. Well, let's let's continue. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your your no, answer no. on your financial literacy program. So why don't we just continue on that? Yeah. No, I said. Why don't I tell you a little bit about our structure and our objectives and how we got this going? Is it you want to go in that direction? Sure. Um, that. Okay. Um, so, like I said, we're small, but. It, it's funny, over 7% of our membership has come forward to volunteer for our financial literacy initiative. And that sounds like an awesome number, right? 7% for volunteers. But our membership is about 220 people. So that gives me about 15. And that's over a period of two years, not all at the same time. So it still means that we're, we're going to be resourced resource stretched. So right from the beginning, we had to take the approach that whatever we're going to do, we have to have the ability to execute it, that we're going to have to have the resources. And, and that really means the, the volunteers 
to come together on it with us. So I had been looking at all the literature and I'm sure you know as much or more than anybody how much is out there, Bob, right? The, it, there's academic stuff, there's government stuff, there are companies who do it. I always say if it exists, I've probably downloaded it onto my hard drive. But <laughs> un, unfortunately for us, most of what was out there is very country specific and we just weren't able to use it. So for instance, we have a very different tax structure and a different retirement system than you find in the US or the UK. So that meant that the bulk of the materials on a lot of subjects and particularly retirement planning, they just weren't applicable for Bermuda. So that meant early on, we knew that we were going to have to create our content uh, which uh, initially seemed daunting, but but the positive of that is, you know, again, as you know, there are basic core principles universally, and and we we found ways that we could just incorporate that into our material. So even though we were creating content, the substance of it it already existed. So we were just tailoring information to be relevant for our community. Um, one of the biggest, I'd say, there were two two important things that happened early on for us. And the first one was what I started to learn from other societies. I went to an SLC conference in Vancouver. So you may know what year that was. I think that might be when I first met you. Yeah, I think um, so. Yeah. But having the benefit of what other societies were doing was huge. It was, it was, it was such a great experience because, as you know, people people like to talk about this stuff. And in our regional discussions, I spoke with CFA Society Bahamas and, and their challenges would be similar to us. Mm -hmm. And they had a program and uh, their program won an award from the Institute, uh, which was which was pretty awesome. And we so we used their program as the initial template to get us started when we were beginning to build out our program. And then at an advocacy, advocacy conference, uh, the, t the topic of financial literacy, at that was very much a theme. And again, I, I got to talk to people from other societies, people who were just starting out, people who had developed programs. So that was so, so beneficial for helping us to get started. And the yeah, second I thing- I think it's sorry. that experience, it's that experience that you're talking about right now, which, uh, you know, had us start the FLN because it's been so helpful for so many societies to hear what other societies are doing and pick up little nuggets and learn from their experience that, uh, you know, sharing that information and sharing resources is really helpful. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm no, no, that's that. all right. And I can say from the, from the podcast that you've already done, you know, I've picked up information it, from other societies, <clears throat> even even if they're what they're doing is not the same target wise, I've gotten ideas about execution, implementation, managing volunteers. So, yeah, it, it's pretty it's pretty helpful, pretty pretty good resource. Uh, no, what I was going to say is, uh, that's just specific for our program is that when we were getting started, very coincidentally, but again, a great coincidence was that our local college approached us and they asked if we would be interested in creating a program that they could deliver through, I'll call it essentially an, their adult education program. So we jumped at that to partner with them because it gave us immediate credibility. We didn't have to go through the who is CFA Society Bermuda, which I'm sure everybody still deals with that, who, who is CFA. And, and we, we jumped over that hurdle. And then we had somebody who was handling the registrations and taking care of the logistics. All we had to do was um, create the program and show up and teach it. So uh, what we created, uh, it, we, we do a four week course and it's one night a week. We say our target audience is the general adult population and we call it an introduction to basic money and financial concepts. Um, but but our emphasis, it's very much discussion and using examples. We, we create a fictional character. They meet her in week one and we take her all the way through to the end. It's amazing how much people beat up on, try to beat up on um, other people. But, you know, we're, we're trying to emphasize um, financial capability is just 
a, a piece of financial well-being and financial well-being should be thought of alongside physical and mental well-being it's it's a lifestyle it, it it's a lifestyle thing it's not it's not something that should sit out on the side so i think we've been very fortunate because since we've done it in this partnership with the college people are willing to commit to 2 to 3 hours at night once a week and i don't think we could have done it that way if we had tried to do it just as a series of seminars yeah that's a that's an interesting partner to have i would think especially if people you know in certain areas don't really know who cfas are or cfa societies are i would think that the college provides a little bit of credibility probably helps to um, create awareness and trust with your audience uh, who may not know who you are initially exactly all right, so what should other organizations, one of the things you said that was really interesting, you know, if you're a CFA society or, you know, organize a nonprofit in the US, you have so many resources to choose from. It really doesn't make sense to reinvent the wheel because there's a lot of good resources. But as you said, once you start getting away from the US and you have different markets, you have different retirement um, platforms, different tax structures, you need to kind of modify you know, you can find existing material and maybe modify it um, or build your own. So what should other organizations that want to use a similar strategy like you've done, what should they consider before kind of designing it and implementing it? Uh, I, I think about this a lot and, and I'm finding like so many other topics, you, you come back to those same things that you tell people when you're talking about financial literacy, right? You, you uh, think about your values. And in this case, it's, you know, what are we, what are we trying to do? What's our mission? And uh, you create your goals, <laughs> short term, mm -hmm. midterm, you, you come up with your strategy, which, you know, I'll say it's analogous almost to your budget and you revisit, you revise, you adjust as you go on. Um, I, I think I think that as a process holds up for so many things, but I think in this case it's very important to define your objectives. And as I said, for us, it was to to stay focused on financial literacy and not extend into investor education. Um, and then it it's the engaging of volunteers because once people start to hear what you're doing what you end up with is a lot of different wants and asks and and it's tempting to expand probably faster than you should so i'll tell you though uh, as an aside um if you're looking to engage your society's membership um be specific on what you're asking for don't just ask for volunteers you know let them know what you're doing and keep the membership informed uh, again especially if you're a small society so when i put out an ask i specifically did not use the word the second time i did it i did not use the word volunteer in the ask i said to, you know who wants to teach financial literacy and that probably got the greatest volunteer response than any other request the society has made for anything yeah because you're not asking people to volunteer for something you're you're asking to actually do something then and, and they know what that is and if they're interested in it they'll be much more engaged with it i think if that's what you probably found yeah so um what do you think is the most important thing you have learned about creating or managing your program at cfa bermuda that you think other societies should understand <laughs> apart apart from the amount of time that it takes <laughs> <laughs> yeah um excuse me, <clears throat> I can answer this in so many different ways, Bob. I, I, and I don't wanna lose sight of the, um, the benefits to the society, to the local society. It, it's, as, as I said, for us, it's been a, an, an incredible source of member engagement <clears throat> and our volunteers are committed, they're passionate, they enjoy doing it. So if you can get a core group of people, th that's probably the most important thing to, to get started when you manage it, but don't, for the society, don't miss the branding opportunity in terms of using it to raise your profile. There, there's a reason, and I think you alluded to this earlier when you were talking about our relationship with the college, there's a reason why people should be confident engaging with us. You know, they can be assured that they're gonna receive 
factual, objective, independent information. I mean, I take it so far that when we bring on new presenters and we're going through what they need to do. And so, of course, you start by giving a brief bio of yourself. And I ask them all not to say where they work. You don't say that. You don't name the bank. You say you could say you're in banking, but you don't you don't name it. We're not affiliated. And I think that's um, I think that's a benefit for the brand. And I, I encourage other societies to think of it that way as well and, and use it. And if you're you're big enough that you have PR and advocacy groups, funnel it over to them and let them run with it. Um, for the program, I'd say if you're approaching it like we did, which is looking to have a very broad community impact, and again, as you pointed out, if, if, if you don't have those readily available partnerships, I'd say allow a certain amount of fluidity in what you do, because as you start to engage with others and continue to develop your program, I'd say listen to what you hear and, and learn from it and use it to create partnerships. For us as a, as a small society in a small country, the benefit of that is that there's probably at least one person on our board who knows somebody in the community to reach out to and can just pick up the phone and set up a meeting with somebody in government, consumer affairs, a social service provider. Um, we, we don't have to go through a whole lot of complication to get right to the source. So that helps us build our partnerships. And it also helps us identify the, the needs. Good point. Very good point. So what do you so what do you think the likely future is for the program at CFA Bermuda? I know that you said you wanted to keep it very specific, very detailed on financial literacy. You're basically dealing with an adult audience. Do you think you're going to expand that? What, what, what's your thinking for the future? Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't want anyone to get the idea that says it that to think that if you say you're going to focus just on financial literacy that 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 keeps it small or keeps it <laughs> narrow right um, we just finished our fifth series and that's pretty exciting. Um, we started in the fall term of 2019 and I think we've had in total about 140 people have taken our course and if you keep that in the context of the size of our population that's that that's a pretty good number right um yeah. and what's happened i i this i say this all the time things kind of happen circumstance happenstance whatever the word is um the this last series that we just did the registration was happening right when bermuda was deeply into the middle of the fourth wave of the pandemic. So our registrations weren't going very well because quite frankly, I don't think this was top of mind for many people. They had, they had more pressing concerns. So I didn't want to cancel the program. So what I did was I reached out to some nonprofits that I had either worked with in the past or knew what they were doing. And what I ended up doing was I offered slots to staff from two different agencies, one agency who focuses on at-risk children and their families, and the other it was is a government entity that helps people with um, employment. And my idea for doing that at the time was twofold. I thought maybe it would create some kind of a future partnership with them going forward if they learn about what we're doing. So maybe we could help provide content for their clientele. And the other idea was just to expose their staff to the concepts because their staff are working with these people every day. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, it's that kind of what is it? It's a spider web, right? Once you once you get you, you just start to get it out and one person learns and another person learns and it just goes and it worked out to be a really good idea. I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from them. And now it looks like that's going to be a springboard for where we're going to go. <clears throat> One of the directions we're going to go in the future is that um, I'm going to, we're going to very deliberately, intentionally invite people who are in the social services area and also teachers. We're going to try and get teachers to come to the class. Because again, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, crack, try and crack that nut of school curriculums. But if I can get the teachers, start with the teachers and have the teachers get the concepts and be comfortable about talking about money, then hopefully that starts to filter, um, filter out. 
Um, the, the other thing that we're looking to do is um, in the course, we talk about the importance of engaging your family in, in your financial decisions. So whether it be being on the same page with your partner about your goals and values, or talking to your children about money. Um, and we've had a lot of good anecdotal stories about how people do that. Um, so we're looking to broaden that, to, to extend that reach. We, we started with the adults and we, we kind of broaden that more to say, let's include the whole family in that. And, and as we engage the family, we're laying the groundwork for moving to young people. We're, we're, taking, the, we're taking the approach that um, again, with limited resources and what's available here, if, if you go straight to the child and you haven't addressed the family, the child goes home and if it's not happening at home, it's not going to have the same impact. So we're, we're kind of trying to bring them all along um, together. So um, actually, that, that's kind of where I think uh, in our next step, that's where the FLN is going to be so important for us, because we have no expertise in um, financial literacy for all the different ages. And, and again, I know from looking at the research, it's, you know, you're talking about cognitive abilities, you're talking about so many different things, but that all exists and it's out there. So uh, I'm looking forward to having the ability through the Financial Literacy Network to talk to other societies. Uh, we don't have to look for curriculums, but find out what, find out what others are doing, um, even if it is through partnerships, uh, get an idea of the concepts and the objectives and how do they manage the, the program. So have a dialogue about it. So I think that's, a, that's an exciting Thing to me about now that the FLN exists formally, that we're going to have that as a resource. That's great. That's really great. All right. So that's all the time we have for this episode. Robin, thank you so much for joining us and giving some of your insights into um, CFA Bermuda and your program and some of the challenges you face as a smaller society. Although it seems to me that because of your smaller population, you guys are well suited um, to uh, be successful there. Um, so for you, for those that are listening, there's a few ways to engage with the FLN. We have a website at financialliteracynetwork.org. Um, we also have a LinkedIn group if you would like to join that. And um, of course, we've already found the podcasts. And also questions um, can be uh, submitted at info at network.org. So with that, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you will uh, attend future podcasts.